Uh, welcome everyone. My name is George Murage and I work with uh, with Intellicup uh, and with Suncup Forum. Our speaker today is is Looney. Uh, Looney is uh, the founder of Fledge and the CEO of Africa Eats. He is a 25 plus year serial entrepreneur, author and founder of six startups. He's also co-founded the Land Accelerator, the first startup bootcamp for land restoration entrepreneurs. I'd now like to hand it over to Looney to take us forward. All right. Welcome, thanks, Looney. George. Over to you. Uh, thanks for having me here. Oh man, I, I just want that background music playing for the next hour, right? To keep keep up the energy <laughs> here. Uh, so uh, let's just flip on some slides here. Uh, this is me in a nutshell. So so who is the speaker? Uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur, as George said. I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, I think that bio is actually a few years out of date. Uh, I started my first company in 1992, spent 20 years building software companies, totally irrelevant to what we do here. Uh, and then I woke up. Uh, and I woke up by discovering a business school, which seems like a weird thing to do because this is all about impact. Uh, but this business school was the first one in the world. It started in 2002. Uh, and it was the first business school to teach how to do good through business how to take the powers of capitalism and apply them to now what we would call the SDGs and make a difference. And that makes all the difference. And so my, well, I was on another call earlier today. They asked me what my theory of change was. It's really simple. My theory of change is there isn't enough philanthropy or government spending to solve the actual problems. If we want to solve the SDGs, we have to bring in the private capital, the, 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 um, uh, the trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars that lives in the private sector, right? The for-profit capitalistic sector. We need that money applied to the, to the world of good. And if we do that, we can actually solve the problems. So that inspired me, right? That work hanging out at that business school, eventually teaching at that business school, that inspired me to do something. So what could I do in the world that was more than just build software companies? Uh, and the answer was Fledge. So Fledge is a global network of business accelerators. I help entrepreneurs. That's what I do now and I have been for the last, for the last decade. But I don't just help entrepreneurs. What I actually do is help entrepreneurs and I help people help entrepreneurs. So uh, except for Seattle and Africa Eats, and I'll tell you what that is in a second, uh, all these other logos are other organizations. So they all came to me saying, how do I teach entrepreneurs? How do I help entrepreneurs? How do I, how do I fill the missing middle, which is the, the title of this conversation today? Uh, and the answer is I, I, I teach that. So if first, first ask out there, if you are someone who wants to help entrepreneurs, uh, I can help teach you how to do that if you don't know how. All right, going back to the bio slide here. Uh, everything else I've done has come out of this work at Fletch. So we spun out a, a, a new structure, and I'll talk about that in the next hour. It's called Africa Eats. And I also accidentally started a nonprofit. So my whole background's in the for-profit side. I do help run a nonprofit. I used to run it myself. Uh, and it's a really strange nonprofit. What we do at Realize Impact is we take philanthropic dollars and we turn them back into investments, specifically impact investments. Uh, and one thing we do, which you'll see that logo pop up a few times in the next hour, uh, we run the Terra Fund for World Resources Institute and the FR100. Uh, we take philanthropic dollars, we turn them back into, into loans to African companies filling in the missing middle. All right, so let's move forward. That, that's looking backwards. Uh, Africa Eats, I said, is a, uh, is a spin off of Fledge. It's a for profit solution for hunger and poverty. I'm going to repeat that a few times. We are out to solve hunger and poverty, not make a dent in, right? Not make a difference in, but to solve hunger and poverty in the continent of Africa. And we think the solution to that is to invest. And we know the solution to that is, is to invest. Because if you look in the past, in the history of, of the North America or Europe, which were not too dissimilar from the African continent 200 years ago, most people being farmers, a lot of subsistence farmers, a lot of hunger, a lot of poverty, and you don't see that today. How did they get solved? How did those problems get solved? Yeah, it got solved by building out the infrastructure. It got solved with business. Same thing's going to happen in Africa. I don't do a lot of business in India, so my talk's going to be much more focused on Africa. Okay, we're here to talk about the missing middle. So why does it exist? Right? I'll define what it is in a bit, but why is there a gap in capital for these, for these companies that are trying to solve these problems? The answer to that 
uh, actually sits in this book, which is strange because this is a book on the history of science. Nothing to do with business, nothing to do with impact. You know, it's a book that, that my wife put in her dissertation. It's cited in her dissertation. She's a philosopher, philosopher of science, but a philosopher. Now, when I do this in person and I ask the room, I got 100 people in the room and I say, who's ever even heard of this book? Usually one or two, one or two hands pop up. But everyone on this call, no, no idea how many people are here. Uh, everyone here knows what's in this book because this is the book that defined the word paradigm. Right, the idea that we talk about, the, the, the layman term paradigm, right? You're stuck in a paradigm. We need a paradigm shift and so forth. It's defined in this book. This is a book from like 1965, 66, 67. Uh, and again, it's describing the history of science and how science works. But the same thing applies to business. The same thing applies to, to nonprofits. The same thing applies to government. Here's what a paradigm is, according to Kuhn. A paradigm is a set of beliefs that you use to filter the evidence, the news that comes into your, into your life. And then when you see this news and it doesn't fit your paradigm, what you do is you ignore it, which doesn't sound right. It sounds like what well, these scientists are supposed to see the new evidence and adopt it, but that's not what actually happens in science. What happens is they have a belief. Let's just take a simple belief like the earth is the center of the universe and everything revolves around it. That was the truth, right? That was what every per all the big thinkers believed until about 1600 and something. And despite the evidence that came in that said, wait, no, these, these orbits of the planets don't make any sense. And, uh, you know, and what, what are, the tides don't make any sense and so forth. All that evidence was just ignored until there was so much evidence, until Ca Copernicus and Galileo had so much evidence, it had to be something else. And then there's a shift and there's a new set of beliefs. And it's hard to get away from those beliefs and so forth. So the ultimate problem of the missing middle is that we are stuck in a paradigm. We're stuck in a paradigm and most people who are in it don't even understand that they're in it. They just assume that that's just how you do things. And they just assume that it had been done forever that way. And there's no other solution. And they continue to make the mistakes of the past because they just don't see where the edges of this paradigm are. They're just ignoring all the evidence. So it started. Here's the paradigm. Started with a guy named George Durrell. Uh, you probably never heard of him. I read the book on the left. I've never even read the book on the right. Um, this is the first venture capitalist in the modern style ever. Right? Uh, born in France, moved to the United States after World War I to make a better life. Uh, helped run the World War II for the United States. Uh, what he's best known for is not actually being a venture capitalist. What he's best known for is that he was an administrator at a new school back in the 40s called Harvard Business School. Harvard College is, of course, 400 years old, but Harvard Business School is not. Harvard Business School got created in the 1940s. Uh, he wasn't a teacher. Um, he taught. He was the most beloved professor of his time, but he actually didn't have the qualifications to be a professor. He was an administrator. Uh, and he had a big following, right? Again, he, he, the most popular class there was at, at the time, which was just called management. <clears throat> uh, the other thing he did while he was administering the school and teaching and running some companies, he also started this thing called American Research and Development. It was the first venture capital company. It wasn't a fund. Funds came a little bit later. It was the first venture capitalist, first venture capital-like thing that existed it started in 1946, just after the war. Uh, this is what their their uh, their annual report looked like in 1953. wasn't that thick. That, 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 that's a that's a mock-up, but um, but that's the actual cover of the of the guide. Uh, it invested in all sorts of things. The, the 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 paradigm didn't start with just software companies. Not in 1953 or 46. Clearly, we didn't have computers back then. But the big the big win for this investment company. Uh, was digital equipment, uh, which if you've not heard of it, was the second largest computer company in the country in the world, you know, in the 60s. Uh, American Research and Development owned the majority of it and, and made an immense, an immense sum of money. Okay, but anyway, we're not here to talk about tech. We're here to talk about the missing middle. So first, you have to understand the paradigm that everyone's stuck in. And the paradigm comes all the way back from 46. 
And it looks like this. So if we sat down with a California venture capitalist and we asked them, what are you looking for? They'll tell you, I'm looking for multi-billion dollar opportunities. I'm looking for business models that can grow really fast, you know, two, three times year over year over year. I need the companies to be 10x bigger in five years and then 10x bigger again. 10x shows up a lot in their conversations. And then, of course, I need a great team to execute. And in fact, when you sit down and ask them, they even skip the first two and they'll just say that what I look for most of all is a great team. And you say, well, what else do you look for? And they go, well, it's really team, team, team. They themselves don't really talk about one and two, but they're there. I I've pushed them and I I've asked them and, and they'll admit one and two are there before you get to team. But there are two more things in their paradigm they don't talk about. The fourth one is that they're a business. So funds exist now, not, not uh, ARD, but all the su funds subsequent to that they're designed to make 15 to 20 investments over the lifetime of the fund, right? Or they're going to invest in 15 to 20 companies, to be more specific. They'll invest a few times into each company. But what that means is they have to actually put to use, burn, like put out there one twentieth of the money in the fund to each of the 20 companies. Some of them will be a little bit bigger and some will be a little smaller but they have to put the money to work. That's how they make money. They make money by using the money. So they have to find business plans that need large sums of money because venture capital funds are hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars now. And so they have to find big deals that can burn a lot of money. And they don't worry about how fast companies burn money. As long as there's a high growth model, they're, ha they're happy burning the money because they have to. And then the other one that they don't talk about, uh, not, not openly and, and proudly, but their whole model is wrapped around these companies getting acquired. A few of them go IPO. A few of them go public. It's really rare. Uh, it it's used to happen more often. It's exceedingly rare now. Uh, nearly every company that has an exit, is what they call it, will be acquired by another company in seven to 10 years. That's getting longer and longer over time. 20 years ago, that was five to seven years. 30 years ago, that was three to five years. It's, it's probably really 12 to 15 years now, but they'll talk about it in seven to 10 years. Okay, that is the paradigm. That is what they're doing. And then if you sit down with an African VC or an Indian VC, I've talked to them as well, and you ask them what their model is, they're gonna reg regurgitate the same thing. And I'm gonna ask them if I'm there, great. Who's buying the companies? You know, the, the way we phrase this is how many exits are there? So how many exits were there in, in Africa in 2021? Fewer than a handful. Uh, how many in India? Maybe two handfuls. How many in the U.S.? A few hundred. There are very, very few. Um, so if there aren't any acquirers, the whole model falls apart because that's the only way the VCs get their money back out. So then the next question to ask as you dig down into this paradigm, you to break the paradigms, you have to question them. Uh, and the next question you ask is, well, okay, in the US where this is working in some cities, doesn't work everywhere, but let's just say in San Francisco or in New York uh, or in Boston, who are the actual companies that are acquiring these, these VC-backed companies? And the surprising thing you find, if you, <laughs> at least surprising because we don't talk about this much, is that the acquirers tend to be companies that got funded by VCs one or two generations ago. So in the 90s, one of the companies doing a lot of acquisitions was Intel, which was a VC-backed company from the 60s. And in the, in the knots, uh, Cisco, knots and tens, uh, Cisco was doing a lot of acquisitions. And Cisco was a VC-backed company from the 80s and early 90s. Microsoft has done a ton of acquisitions, hundreds and hundreds of companies, uh, and they were slightly VC back. They're, they're a slightly different uh, path, but they're in that same same space. Uh, and they were a public company in the mid '80s uh, and VC backed in the in the uh, early '80s. And then, of course, Google. I don't know. Google's probably bought thousands of companies, mostly for their for their people, not even for their products. Uh, and Google was, of course, funded by VCs in the um, very late 90s, um, you know, very early, I think it was before the dot-com bubble. I think it was the very late 90s. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, point is, 
that the cycle of acquisitions in the venture capital world is funded by the venture capital world. That if you want to have a thriving VC ecosystem, wherever you are, whether that's uh, you know New Delhi or, or Kinshasa, well, it's going to take a long time because the companies that are going to acquire the current crop of, of venture-backed companies are the ones you're funding right now. And it's going to take you 10 or 20 or 30 or 50 years to get the cycle going, if it ever gets going. That is one cause of the missing middle, is we don't have that cycle. All right, so a few more things on the background here. So when was the first actual venture capital fund? We know what it was. It's not that long ago. It was 1961. It was Davis and Rock. Here's pictures of them. Uh, I think they're still alive. Like We're not talking about something that happened in the last century. We're talking about something that happened just before I was born, 50-something years ago. 50, what was it? 61 years ago now. Um, and it happened in California, of all places, right? We talk about, we, th we think of venture capital as something that happens in Silicon Valley, and it does. And, and this company, this, this fund, was from Silicon Valley. It really started there. Uh, they funded two of the huge names of Silicon Valley. They funded Fairchild and Intel in the 60s. Uh, uh, it, the, the, this didn't work for them. Like for whatever reason, the team broke up. Uh, Arthur Rock though, turned out to write a check to a little company in Silicon Valley called Apple. He was an angel for Apple. Uh, and Davis, oop, there's a typo there. Uh, Davis was the founder of Mayfield, which is still one of the top five VC funds in the world. I don't think he still works there, but he was the founder and his, his fund still exists. And this was a you know, 10, 10 year, two and 20, all the normal things we're used to in seeing a fund, it was there in 1961. And the next one after that, oh, and sorry, and they were both students of Duro in, in HBS. That was the connection. So they learned about it from their, from their mentor. And then same thing kind of happened in Cambridge, Massachusetts, in Boston, basically. Uh, a few years later, Greylock got started. So it was basically looking at the graduates of MIT and Harvard and and the, commu the tech community that was built up around uh, Boston. Uh, the four people who founded Greylock worked at AMR&D, worked at American Research and Development with Duro. So he taught them as well. Uh, and they funded a few things that you've heard of and a few you haven't, but they funded Facebook and LinkedIn. Like this is where the VC money came from. And it dates back to 65, not the same fund that got started in 65. Whatever we are now, the 10th fund or the 15th fund or the, or the 20th fund, uh, but it's still going on in the same style. They moved out of Boston in 2009. They're now a California VC as well. And just to drive home how, how recent this is or what era we're talking about. So venture capital, as we see it today, is the same age as the Beatles, right? Which may seem old to a, to a lot of you people out there, um, but it's not. It's, it's, you know, my, my parents were, were you know, teenagers or early 20s when the Beatles were doing this. It's the same basic age as the, as the era of decolonization. So you know, Kenya is older than Greylock, and Kenya is two years younger than the first VC fund. Uh, but it's in that same, same realm of time. And you know, Kenya was one of the earliest in, in Africa to, to gain independence. Okay, so... This is the model that we, we usually talk about in the tech world. This is a, a chart that you know, I recreated from what I saw 20 years in talking in tech. Uh, there's a few different stages of funding. The one that, that, that um, upsets the entrepreneurs the most is the seed round. So, and, and VCs used to be there in that space, and then they left. And, and so there's a, there's a hole left in the market. And that hole is either called the pioneer gap, or when we want to be a little bit uh, less happy about it, we call it the valley of death. And it's the valley of death because there are so many companies that are over here in the, in the pre-seed space, uh, so many companies that have a decent idea. Sometimes they have friends and family money. Sometimes they get to a customer or so in that space, but then they need some money to get real, right? get, to, get to scale. And there isn't enough money in, in any city except San Francisco for that. So a lot of companies just die because they can't get funding. And so we call that the valley of death. There's a gap for them to jump over. And then if they can get to the other side, if they do get funding from angels or crowdfunding or accelerators or whatnot, and they can find some customers, they can start to grow. 
And then the VCs show up to fund them in that growth stage. And then all goodness happens at the exit, of course. Okay, when we look at SMEs, when we look at small and medium enterprises, which, uh, by the way, SMEs is a derogatory term in the VC world. Not in my world. In my world, they're great. Uh, but, but you know, over here, I'm over on the West Coast of the U.S., SMEs is a bad term. It's like, no, 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 we don't touch them. They're, they're not big enough. All right, we'll, we'll just ignore that for the rest of the day. So just to flip between these two graphs, what's different? Well, what's different is that this gap is bigger. Uh, it may not physically be more money, but there's a step up between having an idea and having enough money to actually make it happen. And especially out in emerging markets, and, and especially what in my work in Africa, this is just just an enormous sum of money that they just can't afford to to find anywhere. There's no friends and family money to fill this in ge in general. This is usually where a grant can make a huge difference or a little check from an accelerator. There really isn't crowdfunding yet in any in any scale. And it's too big for almost everyone. And so what you find is tens of thousands of companies, and I'll show you how to find them in a, in a few minutes, tens of thousands of companies that want to get through this gap and no one's funding them. So how big is this gap? Yeah, it varies from place to place. So the poorer the country, the smaller the, the smaller the actual dollar values. So when I visited Malawi, if I had handed out five thousand dollar checks, I, you know, I, in ten checks I could have funded ten companies, right? Um, you know, ten. Sorry, in fifty thousand dollars I could have funded ten companies and got them through that gap and off and running. And when I go to a slightly higher, richer country, it might be ten thousand dollars. And in Nigeria, the the behemoth of the of the continent, it might be 50K. Um, there's plenty of companies where 50K is more than they need. And then in general, you know, the biggest biggest opportunities may be a few hundred thousand dollars, but not a half million dollars. A million dollars is too much, right? I have I've personally signed many, many, many hundred thousand dollar contracts to fill in this gap for, for hundreds of companies. So where do you find them, right? The Where, where are these companies hiding? Right? And they're not hiding. They're, they're looking for us, the investors. So here's a screenshot. Uh, simple example. Here's a screenshot from the Land Accelerator Africa. I just took this today. Uh, we had over 1,400 companies apply to this program this year. This is not the Land Accelerator Africa forever. This is just 2022. And this program only serves companies that work in restorative forestry and restorative agriculture. And I looked at every single one of these applications, and there were maybe 20 that didn't fit that. There were two from India, one from France, uh, we said Africa, um, and then there were a handful that weren't in restorative anything. They, they, they didn't do that. Uh, but there were 1,400 companies that did fit, and they all were searching for help, and they were all searching for money. And if we had, you know, call it $5,000 times 1,400 companies, we could fill in the missing middle for all these companies. Of course, we didn't have that much money because that much money is not even flowing into Africa. Uh, but we helped 100 companies out of this group and um, not with cash, but with help. Uh, and we'll give some of them some cash later. Where else? Well, uh, over at TerraFund, TerraMatch, we ran a program last year where we asked for, for applicants and we had 2,000 other companies come through. Uh, there's some overlap between the two because these are both restorative uh, forestry and agriculture, but there were thousands more that showed up into this pool that didn't show up into that pool and vice versa. Uh, and then across the whole fledged network across my last decade of work, there's tens of thousands of companies. What I learned in doing this over the years is I really don't, no matter how focused you are, no matter how tight a space you're, you're in, whatever your personal impact is, it is, there are hundreds of companies or thousands of companies or tens of thousands that are looking for you in terms of uh, funding and help. Uh, that, and that number just keeps going up. So every year there's more accelerators, but every year there are more entrepreneurs searching for help. Uh, and I've seen that again for 10 years. My first program in Seattle, we had like 60 applicants. My most recent one in 2020 in Seattle, we had 845. At the Land Accelerator, the numbers were like 300, 800, 1,200, 1,400. The numbers just keep going up. Okay. So 
let's talk about what real companies look like. Let's look at a couple examples of missing middle companies and what happens if you fill in that missing middle. So here, let me take a take a quick drink. All right. Agro Supply. Uh, it's in Uganda. They sell seeds to farmers. How many companies in Africa sell seeds to farmers? I don't, I've not, I've never seen that market research, but it's a very large number. All right. Uh, these guys have an interesting business model, but that was, yeah, that got my attention. But, you know, they were selling seeds to 5,000 farmers in 20, in the, by the end of 2019. They were earning it was just shy of 100,000 US dollars back then. And it was year three. Year one was, uh, was 2017 and, and a lot smaller. Okay, so the growth was good, but the company was still pretty tiny. Hundred thousand dollars is, is is you know not super tiny, but not huge. How many people out there? You can throw your answers in the chat window. How many? I don't know how many investors we have in the in the room here, but how many of of the in, of the investors out there even bother to look at companies that earn you know slightly under a hundred thousand dollars in a year? I don't know very many. At the Land Excel, we run a, a an investment panel, you know, once or twice a year, we bring in lots of investors to talk on it. I usually moderate it. I ask them what scale of company are you looking for, and uh, really rarely one ever said under a hundred thousand dollars. Usually, it's two hundred and fifty or five hundred thousand. Usually, it's a million dollars a year. So here we have we got a company that earned a hundred thousand dollars, was looking for some money. Right. They, they probably asked for a lot, but it didn't matter. They needed some money. They were profitable, by the way. Uh, and what could you do? Well, Fledge gave them $20,000. And Africa Eats got started in 2020, and we lent them $50,000. And they doubled. And that's good. They got to be much bigger. I, I like doubling. You know, doubling the 100% growth in a year is good. 50% growth in a year is good, too. I like to see the companies get bigger. Uh, and doubling is like a nice and fast pace. I don't want to go faster than that, but but it happens. So here we go. We got a company now. It's two hundred thousand dollars. We started touting this to institutions. You know, just a few hundred, not, not not one or two, but you know, I know a few hundred institutions. I started touting this one and some others to the institutions. And how many showed up to help them? Yeah, zero, because it's a two company. It's got two hundred thousand dollars. It's been around for four years. It just doesn't look big enough. Uh, but what every institution missed but us is that the next year it was a million dollars. And no, it wasn't a million because we gave them 800000 or a million or, or $2 million of capital. We gave them a little bit more. There's a few hundred thousand in lending in here and a teeny bit of equity. Uh, but they grew tenfold from 100000 to a million dollars in two years. And it's not a fluke. It, it, they're still going. it will be $2 million this year. Right, they're at one point six, I think, by, by now this this part of the year. Uh, we'll find out their Q three in in a few weeks. This is what happens when you give the right amount of money to the right company at the right time, plus some help. Uh, and it's not a fluke, fluke. This is, this is not the only one. I have I have a dozen. I can't fit all of the, all the stories into this into this hour. But here's another one. We met them at the same period of time. They were in the same cohort at Fletch. And so here's a company. It's a dairy company in Tanzania. Uh, and they too were, uh, this one's just over $100,000 a year. Fourth or fifth or sixth largest in the country. There's some really big competition, right? They were doing one thing different than everyone else, but nothing that no one could copy. There was no no big moat or or chance of monopoly or anything that the normal VCs looked at. I talked to this entrepreneur. I said, what do you need to double? He said, we're at capacity. He said, my pasteurizer is fully being fully used. I need another one. And I said, well, how much is it going to cost? And literally, this happens to me all the time. I'm, I'm literally talking to him in Zoom in real time. And I say, what do you need? And he says, it's expensive. I go, yeah, OK, that's nice. How much? I, I, I have to import it from, from India or China, where, wherever it was from. And I go, yeah, OK, I understand. I've done this before. How much is it going to cost? And he said, it's more than we have. I go, yeah, I know. I'm an investor. That's why I'm here. How much is it going to cost? And he's, he just doesn't want to answer the question, but I finally got the answer out of him. Uh, by the way, this is the pasteurizer. This is a picture of the actual pasteurizer. And it cost, landed in Tanzania, $15,000. So he couldn't grow his company from 132 because he was missing 
$15,000. That's it. Like he had profits, but he didn't have that scale of profits. So what did we do? We gave him $20,000. And why did, was it 20? Because that's what Fledge does. It does $20,000 checks. If he needed 25, he would have done that. If he needed 35, he would have done that. In fact, we got him $65,000 that year in total. What did he do with $65,000? Yeah, he turned it into a, a company earning $1.2 million in a year. Ninefold growth in one year, which was as stressful as it sounds. I don't, I don't advise that scale of growth. Um, but he had a really good year. And then he didn't ask for anything the next year. He said, I'm, I'm, I just need to recover from the previous year. That was stressful. And we said, fine. You know, we, if you don't want anything, we don't, we don't give you anything. Uh, it grew to 1.9 million without him pushing on it. Uh, and uh, it'll be down a little this year because there's a drought in Tanzania. But it's not going back down to 132. It's going back down to you know, somewhere between 1.2 and 1.9. And then we'll get it to you know, 4 and 5 and 6 in future years. We did this on $65,000. That's the missing middle. In this case, $65,000, not $5,000, not $200,000, not even $100,000. Okay, let's go just do another one. Uh, oh, the, uh, the jump in revenue was because he had a pasteurizer, and so he could make more milk, and he could sell more. He had a, he had a huge demand of customers who wanted milk, and he couldn't get it to them because he, he literally couldn't pasteurize the milk, and then he could. And then... Uh, there was actually a glut that year. And so he made some into yogurt. And he sold like $600,000 of yogurt in one quarter. So part of that giant growth was he brought another product to market because he could. And poof, it just took off. Similar to this one. This is, uh, this is from Rwanda. Uh, so this young entrepreneur applies to Fledge in 2016. He's got a little tiny meat processing company. Uh, we say yes, and the U.S. government wouldn't give him a visa. Happens sometimes. It's really annoying because uh, we do this. We used to do these programs in person. Uh, so 2017 comes around, like six months later. We used to run twice a year. Uh, we invite him again. The, the U.S. government wouldn't give him a visa. So frustrating. Uh, but luckily, I had a program in Peru. So of all places, I sent this Rwandan to Peru uh, to get training and to get money. And so at 2017, he's in year two. He's got a tiny little company earning $35,000. He's like the fourth largest meat processor in the country of Rwanda. Uh, and his total list of equipment, I remember this interview as well. Uh, what do you have and what do you need? Well, I, have a, I have a sausage stuffing machine. So I'm picturing like, uh, you know, industrial grade sausage stuffing machine, you know, on a, on a large amount of stainless steel and all that. No, no, no. He had one hand cranked sausage stuffing machine. And that's it. That was producing $30,000 worth of business plus, you know, some hamburger meat and some other stuff. Um, who, who else here would, would even bother talking to this guy? This is, again, the missing middle. No one wants to talk to a guy with a, a tiny little business doing, doing sausage in Rwanda, of all places. But I do because I like helping these people and I know how to fill in these gaps. So what did we do? We gave him, oh, sorry, before I even get that, he shows up in Peru and I show up in Peru to meet him. And he has a second company. And he started a second company because he, at $35,000, ran out of commercials, commercial grade meat or commercial grade animals. So he started a company to grow the animals. And he promised me it would make no money for years. And he fulfilled that promise. So uh, this company had zero revenue in 2017. And again, in 2018, 2019, 2020, made some money in 21. Uh, but by the time we got to 21, it had thousands of animals. It's a great business model. You just have to be patient. So what do we do? Well, we Peru only gave $15,000. So I, I matched that and we give him $15,000. And I told him, split it between the two companies any way you want. I don't care. You, you, you know best, not me. And so we split it like six and uh, six and uh, I don't remember, seven and eight. Um, smaller amount went to the livestock company. But it went to the live. There, some of the money went to the livestock. We were talking fifteen thousand dollars total across two companies, and then he asked a few years later for maybe ten thousand more, and that's it. That's that's all we ever put in this company was like twenty five thousand dollars. Two companies, sorry, was about twenty five thousand dollars, and by twenty twenty one, that was about eight hundred thousand dollars worth of companies, profitable. I, I always talk revenues. I don't. I don't talk profits. 
uh, but they, it's profitable. And we merged them back together this year. Um, on nothing, like I, on, on a rounding error for for most, you know, on, on what what most institutions just spend flying their due diligence teams around. Uh, we got this company to a million four this year as as a single company. But that's not the whole story from this one. This one gets even more exciting because in 2020, he uh, because of the lockdowns, he had four trucks. Uh, Rwanda has more than one city. He was exporting to Goma and, and uh, DRC. Uh, it's a little more complicated than like in Tanzania where you just have to serve Dar es Salaam or, or Kenya where you just have to serve Nairobi. The population spread around a little more into Rwanda. So he had four trucks and he was moving all his stuff around in, in five cities plus uh, plus across the border to DRC. And when the lockdowns hit, he couldn't do all, he couldn't do that with his own meat. There were some restrictions. So he spun out his trucks into a logistics company to try and earn some money. And it earned a little bit in 2020. And then in, for the year of 2021, it earned a half a million dollars. Uh, and that was pretty good. So we invested in 2022 into this company. Uh, it looks like this now. Uh, so this company has all of eight trucks and it's not just serving Rwanda. It's serving East Africa from Rwanda. Like most of these routes are uh, hub and spoke. Most of this is somebody wants to import something from Dar and bring it to Rwanda or they're growing chickens in Rwanda and export them to Dar. Something like that. Uh, so the trucks are going down to Zimbabwe and Zambia and up to Kampala and out to Nairobi and so forth moving food around this region uh and so what's this company done it'll be a 1.6 million dollar company this year on two hundred thousand dollars of capital and logistics is a capital intensive business and yet you know we're earning eight dollars uh, eight dollars per dollar invested uh, that's what happens when you find the right company and give them the right money at the right time okay let's finish off these stories with one more this is the oldest one in my portfolio. The first, the first native African I worked with, it was 2014 when I met him. He had just finished year one. So year one was $100,000 of revenues. He did that on $4,000 of capital of his own money. Uh, and in year one, uh, this was the largest fruit and vegetable aggregator in the country of Tanzania, which is crazy. Like, How did the country go for 50 years without a fruit and vegetable aggregator? I don't know, but this 24 year old at the time decided to fill in that gap. Uh, so what we do, we gave him, I think it was 17,000 back then. I don't think we were at 20 yet. Um, and then we got him a Kiva loan and then some angels stepped in. In total, we got him $67,000 of capital. That's it. That's all, that's all I could find for, for a Tanzanian entrepreneur in 2014. There were a lot fewer investors back then. That was all he needed to get $2 million a year. It didn't, he didn't do it in a year or two. It took him a little longer, but he got past a million dollars a year by 2019 on $67,000 a cap. And then once past a million, the institution started, started talking to him. He's raised a few million since then, uh, which is nice because it'll hit 11 million this year. So this is the first company that I've worked with that will be 100 times bigger than when I started working with them. And they're not going to stop at 11 million. That would be what they do this year, next year, 20 something year or 30 something uh, and onward. And this is still the biggest uh, fruit and vegetable aggregator in Tanzania by far now. The, the number two is some small guy with, with a truck and a and 100K a year. So I, I share these stories because I've done this. You can do this too. Uh, and either you or someone you know this can do this too. It's not that complicated a formula. It's three steps. Uh, so let me walk you through the steps because I want to see this happen. I don't want to be the only one doing this in the whole world. I want lots of people to follow along. So step one is an accelerator. And again, if you remember that map from Fledge, I've helped lots of people start accelerators. That's, that's part of what I've been doing for, for a decade. Uh, the one that is the, the biggest in Africa in my, in my crowd is the land accelerator. And it was created around a table in a few hours in 2018. You know, the person from WRI came, came here to Seattle and she left a few hours later with a plan. Uh, again, we had 1400 applications this year for it. Just a few hundred the first year, but we're, we're just in year four. These things build on themselves. 
Uh, we now invite 100 per year to come in. So we have over 200 alumni just in the Africa program. WRI does the same program in India and Latin America. I just don't help, I don't help them with that. I, I help them get it going. Uh, and then in terms of investments, we don't do the investments inside the accelerator. We do it with a separate fund and it's funded in a separate way. Uh, but we have the Terra Fund and it's put a few million dollars to work at for-profit companies in Africa doing the same kind of uh, restorative effort. Uh, and, my, and my nonprofit runs that. What do we do in an accelerator? A lot of people you know, heard the term, but don't know what to do. Well, kind of three things. We do some entrepreneurship training. Uh, and so I taught MBAs. I teach the same stuff to, to entrepreneurs all over the world. It doesn't matter where you are. You need to know, to, you need to know the same thing. You need, to know, you need to know how to do business planning. Uh, we do some mentoring. So we have some business people who come and chat with the entrepreneurs and, and help them solve their problems. And then we teach them how to tell stories. We get them up on stage and we, uh, we teach them how to tell the story of their business in a compelling way so that other people will listen, whether those are investors or, or, um, or customers or, or you know, partners or whatever, whatever. A lot of entrepreneurs just don't have that skill. And if they don't have the skill of pitching and storytelling, nobody listens to them and they get stuck. So that's actually something we focus on a lot. Part of what falls out of this and part of what's different about starting with the accelerator model versus starting with the standard fund model is that the result is, is a different kind of relationship. Uh, it's what I call relationship investing. So just to go off on a tangent for a second here, uh, the huge difference between what I do in my way and what every, every other institution that I'm, I'm working with does uh, is we set up a relationship. We don't look like this. We don't have people come and sit on the other side of the table with us, the other side of the desk, and say, I need some money. And we look at them and do our due diligence and decide whether or not to, to, you know, to write them the check and then have that relationship of, I wrote you a check, you owe me some money back. Do a little bit of that at the Terra Fund. I don't like that model. It doesn't work very well. This is an actual screenshot of what Fledge looks like in practice. Uh, this is one, two, three, four entrepreneurs sitting around a table uh, with, a, with two mentors, can't, one standing, one sitting. I'm there. I'm the one taking the picture. Uh, and we're discussing their businesses. We sit with them together and work on their business plans. That's what we do at an accelerator. We help them figure out their business plans. And usually when it's literally me and them, we're sitting on the same side of the table. And we're staring at the same computer and we're working on the plan together or a whiteboard or whatever. We're not adversarial at all. We're there to figure out the plan together. And that makes all the difference. Because then going forward, when they say, I need, and they give a number, whether it's $5,000 or $50,000 or $67,000, we know that's true because we help build the plan. And we don't have to dig for months to try and figure out why we shouldn't invest because we built the plan. So if we, build, we believe our own numbers, then we just write the check and we give it to them and you know something will happen, sometimes, sometimes bad, but usually good. And then when they come back a few months later and they say, yeah, that, yeah it's, here's, how, here's what we learned and here's how much more we need because you almost always need more. We're like, okay, well, where, where did we get, what did we get wrong in our plan? In our plan, not your plan, our plan. Okay, and that makes sense. And okay, you, oh, we were off by $10,000. Well. Okay, let's just amend the agreement and here's $10,000 and let's go. And many, many, many times over the last 10 years, what, ma what made all the difference in the missing middle was the $5,000 or $10,000 or $15,000 that we forgot about when we put the plan together. Write that check, move on, good things happen. We also have the opportunity to set up good habits. So a lot of these entrepreneurs just don't know how to speak investor. They don't know what the investors want. They don't know, they don't understand the, the relationship from the investor point of view. So we fill that out. We, we, we teach them that. We teach them that, you know, when you take out a loan, you have to pay it. Like whether it hurts or not, you have to pay it because it makes for a good relationship and gets the investor to, to write you checks again. You have to tell the investors what's going on. You have to send the monthly updates. I know it's a, it's, it's a distraction. You want, you, have, you want to do something else, but do it. It's good for you. You'll, you'll see in a few years, good things will happen if you do those updates. 
So we have those opportunities in the accelerator model to, to teach these, these nice little simple habits. Okay, uh, step two, write some checks. Like to fill in the missing middle, it's not good enough just to give knowledge. If all you do is run a program that gives knowledge and, and gets investment readiness to companies, you're just actually causing more problems. We just get more companies in the missing middle. So go raise some money and write some checks. Doesn't have to be large sums of money. You could start at village scale with thousand dollar checks. You could start in city scale with five thousand dollar checks. Start small. Find those the right company at the right time. Put the money to work. As you have more stories to talk about, like I have, you'll you'll raise more funds. And as you raise more funds, you can write bigger checks or or more checks. Uh, that's what's needed to fill in the missing meter. We we literally need more checks being written by more institutions. And the third step is the step I took in 2020. So the answer to the question of, okay, what about those acquisitions? How do you get your money back out? Right? The real question is, how does the money come back out? Right? You put it in, uh, in uh, as a check, you put it in as debt, you got to get it back out in some form. And so my answer to that is don't. Uh, my answer to that is actually create a permanent capital holding company that just holds the holds the investments forever. Make equity investments and hold them forever. Grow those companies. Create value in those in those companies, uh, and then don't try and get the money back out. Instead, have an IPO of your holding company structure. And this may sound a little strange, right? This is what Africa Eats is. It's a permanent capital holding company, Mauritius based, with twenty seven, I think, companies in the portfolio today, uh, and growing based in 10 countries, uh, about $10 million worth of ownership in about $80 million worth of companies. If you, if you wanted to buy all the companies right now, 100%, it, you would spend about $100 million, just shy of $100 million doing that. We own about 10% of that, 12% of that. Uh, our companies grow really fast or faster than normal. So this is a real chart. This is the stacked aggregate revenues or the stacked revenues of all of our companies all the way back to 2014. And so we were at uh, $17 million, 16.8 in 2021. We'll cross uh, 20 something this year. Uh, these same companies back in 2016 did 1.7 million, 1.6 million. They've already grown tenfold since 2016. Like Africa Eats didn't start till 2020. The, the curve got steeper because we started at Africa Eats. But most of the companies were around in 2016. They were tiny little companies back then. Uh, Fledge met the first one in 2014. Fledge has been investing in them up through 2020. And then Africa Eats took over. Uh, so it's these companies that can grow this faster out there. You just have to go find them. What do you do? What kind of checks do you write? I said equity is great. It's not the only source of capital. It's not the only format of capital. Uh, we see a lot of other needs from our companies. Uh, number one need is invoice financing. They got an order. They got a nice order from a big customer. And uh, the problem is they have to pay the farmers now for the outputs. They'll get paid by the customer in 60 days. That leaves a gap. Who fills the gap? Yeah, in the, in the global north, that's what the banks do. In the global south, nobody fills the gap. It doesn't get filled. It doesn't happen. The invoice, the, the orders don't get filled. The companies don't make money. They don't get bigger. So we fill the gap. That's one of the main things that Africa Eats does. We'll do invoice financing when we can. Same thing with operational capital. Sometimes you have to put the seeds in the ground, wait a whole season until you harvest them and then sell to customers. Who, f who funds that? Yeah, almost no one funds that. And for these size companies, no one funds that. We do. Uh, sometimes what they need is a truck. There's goods over there. They need them over here. How do you get them there? Well, you can call the guy with the truck, the man with the van. You can do that until you have a company that's earning a few hundred thousand dollars a year, and then you find he's just not, there's just not enough of him or he's just not reliable enough. You need your own truck. In the global north, you would just go to the truck dealer and you would lease a truck or you'd go to the bank and get a truck loan. Can't do that in Africa. I don't know why. Uh, it's, it's not the super high risk thing that the banks think it is. Uh, we do that. We fill in that gap. Uh, and any, any other need, we just do equity. <clears throat> Uh, the problem in this valley of death again is 
if I fund a company, this is this is really why I did Africa Eats because I had Fledge and we were doing like the equity investments, but then someone would come to me with an invoice financing. I'm like, I I I I don't have Fledge doesn't have a mechanism to do that. I can't find an institution to fill in the gap. So I can, might be able to get a company here, but then in order to get them over that last little hump, uh, some other institution needs to get fine. It needs to get found. And so if if the if the solution that we build out in the global south is each institution does one of those pieces, then we don't solve the actual problem. Right? What we need are institutions that that fill in the whole gap, whatever it is in whatever form it is. And so that's one what's one more piece of Africa eats. We'll do whatever investing it takes to get them through this valley of death. That's the paradigm shift. The paradigm shift is to invest in a different way. It's to invest bottom up from the companies that already exist, give them the right amount of capital, uh, help them grow. Uh, so actually, I haven't written the book yet. I'll write the book after I've proven this is success. I, I made the cover of the book. And the, the basic premise is this, just, just to wrap up. Uh, what if ownership was perpetual? What if you owned, you invested in companies and owned them forever? You weren't trying to flip them. You weren't trying to exit. You weren't trying to get them acquired. You're just trying to get them bigger and your ownership stays around forever. So investments are forever. What if investments were forever? Well, if investments were forever, you still have to get your investor, your, the money you got from investors, you need to get that back to them in some form. Don't take it out of the entrepreneur's pocket. Right? Instead, just grow something of value. In this case, we grow a portfolio of investments as value. And then we... Um, we don't worry about ever getting those those exits out of out of them. Instead, what we wind up with is something that looks a lot like Berkshire Hathaway. So Africa Eats, I, I often joke, Africa Eats is Berkshire Hathaway 1964, right? Give us 50 years and we expect it will be a multi-billion dollar company. Berkshire Hathaway was, didn't start as a multi-billion dollar company. This is, this is the sixth largest company in the United States in 2017. I think they're, they dropped to seventh or eighth place now. But it's a humongous company. And that's what it does. It, in, it buys all or part of companies, provides them with whatever financing they need, and never gives out any money to its investors. All it does is it, it grows the value of its shares every year because the combined value of these investments goes up. And if investors want to leave, they can leave. They don't leave by taking money out of BNSF or Geico or Duracell or Fruit of the Loom. No, no, no. They leave because some other investor comes in and buys their shares. So in this mechanism, we can raise money into SMEs in Africa or anywhere else, and the money stays there. And the investors can get out through the public markets. And that is the... Oh, sorry. Uh, there's one, one last conclusion here, which is that's the story of Africa Eats. And we, are, we have proposals out to replicate it as Africa Trees or Africa Dairy or Africa Power. Um, I'm expecting that in the next 20 years, there's going to be a, a slew of these holding companies out there. And I am going to be very angry if I have to do all of them. Right? I'm hoping that there's lots of copycats out there. So if anybody would like to copy this model, please reach out to me. Uh, I am looney at africaeats.com. I'm very happy to teach you how to do this. And with that, I think I hit the timing just right. Got five minutes left in this session. Uh, I created a virtual meetup. Who, for anybody who wants to talk about this, you know, turn on the microphones and have a big group discussion instead of just me lecturing. Uh, that is sitting in the chat window. And you can find it in community on WOVA. You can find it in community um, uh, meetups. But uh, I see it in the chat window. And I see a couple questions in here. Um, somebody asked me, do I have areas I invest in? So as Fledge, I wear a lot of hats. As Fledge, I invest in anything impactful. Don't care where it is. Don't care what it is. If you can measure it on the SDGs, I like it. Uh, in Africa Eats, we have a lot tighter focus. It's Sub-Saharan Africa food and ag, and ideally supply chain. Companies building the supply chain. We don't invest in farms. We don't invest in commercial, commercial scale, scale growing. We invest in companies that buy from smallholder farmers or sell to smallholder farmers that build the supply chain. Uh, we do that because that's needed. Um, somebody asked, 
why did the revenues jump on these companies? I, I gave a bunch of examples of, of growing revenues. Yeah, more often than not, it was really simple. They had a huge demand, whatever they're doing, whether it's seeds or, or fruits or, or chickens or fish or cooking oil, there's a huge demand for this food. Everybody wants to eat. Everyone wants better food. So these companies I find have, a, have more demand than supply. We provide them with the capital to go and increase the supply. They fill that. And inevitably, in, in almost every case, the demand just goes up. And so uh, we haven't found the ceiling on, on uh, basically any, and maybe one company so far has found a ceiling. Everybody else has a you know, hundred times or a thousand times growth potential. Uh, so we're, we don't have any companies in the portfolio in Africa Eats where we're, we're searching for, pro, um, for uh, product market fit is how we would talk about it in tech. We don't have any tech. We're not software companies hoping that the app works. We're literally just moving food from farmers to retailers and uh, and just ordinary everyday food, not cocoa, not not coffee, honey, maize in some cases, chickens, fish, uh, fruits and vegetables. Nice and simple. Don't You don't have to be so complicated. Uh, Looney, um, I think we have about three minutes left. There are some questions that came in through Hoban. I'd like to, to pose them to you so maybe you can respond to those. Okay. Uh, Ronnie asks, what's the single most effective way of building young entrepreneurs? I think if you could answer that in a sentence or two, what would the response be? Um, surrounding them with, with help. Uh, so it's that not again? surrounding them with, with, a, with a network of support is, is how I usually talk about it. So it's not giving them a coach. It's not giving them a mentor. It's giving them a network of mentors, giving them some training giving them answers to whatever questions they come up with, and then giving them just enough money to go prove themselves out. Um, not too much money, not too little money, uh, just enough money. You find out what, the, what, what is just enough by sitting there and doing a financial model with them. Okay, one other question is, is it possible to change the administrative systems imposed on us by imperialists for their capital, for their financial gains? Um, there's definitely the the largest source of capital out there is uh, trying to maximize their returns. I don't have any of that capital in in anything I've done. Uh, I've not sought it, and I've not uh, I've, I haven't turned it down either. But I'm just not in those circles trying to raise the capital. I raise capital from circles that call themselves impact investors, uh, and in the impact investing world, there's a a desire to actually have something good come out of the money not just not just more money uh, i expect more of the the wall street is how we'll call it here uh i expect more of wall street to show up as we prove out the ability to make money in this in these methods uh but they're gonna have to live with our terms and our terms just to be clear is we'll make them a lot of money because the opportunities in, at least i'm seeing in africa are humongous and so if someone would like to make a billion dollars, I'm happy to make them a billion dollars. Just give me a billion to, to start with. I'll double it. I'll double it for them. Uh, uh, that's not a problem. But I don't do it because of the money. I do it because of the impact. Uh, I think maybe maybe one last question we can take. Uh, uh, Nina asks, I love the success stories, but surely there must be some stories that are less fortunate. How do you deal with losses and potential debt or, or business failures? You write them off. So um, one thing that surprised me at Africa Eats, we started in, in 2020 when the lockdowns hit on purpose. Uh, I would, if you asked me then how many of your, I think it was 25 companies back then uh, will be around in 2022, I would have said, you know, 90%. Uh, we lost no company so far. Uh, we lost one entrepreneur to COVID-19. That was tragedy. And her company is struggling, struggling to keep growing. It's probably shrinking this year versus last year. Uh, and then we have some others that are struggling. Not all of my companies are, are flying up at 5x, 9x growth. Some of them are flat. Some of them are a little bit down. Uh, what we do when they're down is we ask them what they need and we try and get it to them. And if, they, if, if that's failing, if that continues to fail, we write them off. So the expectation as an early stage investor, early stage being anything under $100 million a, a year. Like, I'll, I'll be an early stage investor forever. Um, 
But uh, the expectation investing in this space, whether debt or equity or any other format, is that you will lose some, that you will make some bad, bad decisions. Yeah. Droughts and floods and whatnot will happen and, and you will lose crops and you will lose businesses and you write them off uh, and you make enough. Part of this structure in, in past talks, I talked about how to make enough to, to deal with the losses. But if you're not losing, if you're not, if, if none of your companies are failing, you're not trying hard enough. Like you're just, you're just not taking enough risk. So it's about getting, yeah, it's about getting the right mix uh, between the, the ones that, you know, are potentially super successful versus the ones that are a lot more risky and, and face a lot more uh, risk of going down. I think, Looney, uh, I mean, we're, we're at the top of the hour. Thank you so much. I'll maybe ask you to plug in the discussion area that you had mentioned before, then Parita can uh, give the final vote of thanks, then we can close. So do you want to just plug in that uh, discussion area that you had spoken about earlier? Oh, uh, she she already did. I see that. I see that in the. Um, I see somebody somebody posted a virtual meetup, which I think is mine. So, it's already there. I I I can't see the chat window at the moment. I see it on my tablet. I don't see it on the screen. Okay. okay great. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for the session, Rooney. I I'm sure it was it's really wonderful to hear the kind of alternatives we all have today to be able to support entrepreneurs across the globe. Uh, we have more than uh, 50 participants joining on both the platforms and a, a lot of interesting questions that if there were any you were not able to answer at the moment, we will be sending them over to you on email and we would love for you to um, sort of respond to them and we'll get back to our attendees. Uh, I would request all the attendees of the session today to please sign up on the community chat that has been posted. Uh, and Looney would be more than happy to interact with all of you. He's, he's been one of the most um, interesting speakers to have throughout our Sankal Forum. Then it's really great to have you again, Looney. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. And I, I will definitely, I'll be up for many more hours tonight answering any chat questions that show up. <laughs> great, great. It's, it's been lovely to have you and requesting everyone to please sign in to next session that will start in half an hour. And uh, we hope you enjoy the Sankal this year. Thank you, everyone.